freue ich mich sehr, äh, jetzt äh, Dr. Janet Smith für das erste Referat begrüßen zu können. Janet Smith ist Professorin und Co-Direktorin am Natalie Voorhees Center for Neighborhood and Community Improvement an der University of Illinois in Chicago. Ich habe Janet bei meinem ersten Chicago-Besuch vor rund sieben Jahren kennengelernt und es hat mich sehr beeindruckt, wie sie in ihrer Lehre und in ihrer Forschung eigentlich sich immer äh, sehr engagiert für benachteiligte Bevölkerungsgruppen in dieser äh, riesigen Stadt, äh, wo wir ja sehr viel wissen, auch in der Schweiz, auch über die Entstehungsgeschichte des Community Development oder über Community Organizing. Äh, dieses äh, Voorhees Center ist, auch, ist ein Forschungszentrum, das sich eben auch tatsächlich mit der Verbesserung der Lebensbedingungen der Menschen in Chicago befasst. Community Development ist so das übergeordnete Thema von Janet und äh, insbesondere fokussiert sie auf das Thema Wohnen von benachteiligten Gruppen, seien es Migranten, Migrantinnen, Frauen, Arme, Obdachlose oder Behinderte. Und spürbar ist immer bei ihr das Engagement für unterprivilegierte Gruppen und um Fragen der Gleichberechtigung im Bereich des Wohnens und der städtischen Sozialpolitik. Janet Smith hat äh, sich in ihrer Dissertation auch mit der Geschichte der Stadt äh, in Chicago befasst und mit der Geschichte der Quartiere und natürlich auch mit den verschiedenen konzeptionellen Ansätzen, die in, im Laufe der Zeit äh, zur Anwendung gekommen sind. Und äh, heute befasst sie sich mit den Entwicklungslinien des Community Development und Community Organizing in Chicago. Äh, wir wollten hören, wie der Stand heute ist und damit ist sie die richtige Referentin für dieses Thema. Äh, noch zuletzt, Janet Smith hat ihren Master in Stadtplanung gemacht und ihr PhD in Urban Studies und sie ist unter anderem Komiteemitglied in, in einer internationalen Fachzeitschrift für Wohnen. Erna? Uh, Janet Smith, Professor und Co-Directrice du Centre for Neighborhood and Community Improvement. C'est un centre de recherche dans la ville euh, de Chicago qui est très proche, qui, est de, qui fait part de l'Université de Illinois. C'est un centre de recherche qui s'occupe en grande ligne de l'amélioration des conditions de vie des habitants de ces quartiers, en général défavorisés de, de Chicago et du Grand Chicago. Les thèmes clés euh, de, de ce centre de recherche, c'est les femmes, les gens avec euh, des arrières migrants, des sans-abri, des handicapés, des personnes en somme qui sont généralement au bord de la société. Euh, elle s'engage spécialement pour tous ces groupes exclus de la société et depuis des années elle fait ça avec ses collègues. Dans son doctorat, elle s'est occupée très spécialement de l'histoire du développement de la ville et de la sociologie de la ville. Elle se pose des questions d'urbanisation spécialement de ces, de ces quartiers-là. Elle connaît très bien l'histoire du développement communautaire nord-américain. Le développement nord-américain, c'est en somme le berceau du développement communautaire. Chez nous, on dirait le berceau de l'animation socioculturelle. Janet, merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to first of all um, note that I wore a blue dress because I'm in the deep end of the pool <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for letting me speak from the deep end of the pool. It's very important <laughs> to be here this morning doing that. Um, I'm going to talk about, as the title is called, Current Challenges and Community Strategies for Community Organizing and, and Development in Chicago. I apologize that I can only speak to <laughs> I already ended myself, when didn't I go to hell? Um, I can only speak in English to you, but I'll do what Americans do. I will speak slowly and loudly and maybe, sorry, that's a, a joke in America. Um, it's not obviously my career to be a comedian. 
So um, I'm going to start by, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak, and especially for Colette Peter and Alex Villanor, who um, now Alex and I have known each other for seven, seven years, I think, yeah, seven, maybe, yeah. Um, I also, for inviting me here, first of all, and all of you um, who have taken such good care of me in providing translation, I think you've always told me what was being said. Um, you have all made me feel so welcome and at home. I also extend from my university um, and from my department greetings and our genuine excitement for the possibilities moving forward in collaboration and exchange with the university. Um, this is something that's been a long time in the making and we're looking forward to an exchange that will begin soon uh, with students going between the two schools um, and uh, also faculty and research exchange. Today I will talk about current challenges and strategies for community development in Chicago. As I was reminded yesterday, the historical context and challenges are quite different than in Switzerland and in many ways, and you will see those. I want to also note that I am a born and bred Chicagoan. If I start to talk like Chicagoan, which is an accent we have, um, you'll note that. But I am um, true to Chicago for over 50 years, um, having lived away from there briefly. But um, it's, a, it's a community that I care deeply about, despite some of the things I'm going to present to you, which are very frustrating. It's why we do community development, why we do community organizing, because we care immensely about what happens in the city, and it's a city that um, is full of people who fight passionately about it. Even though there are differences, I think that the strategies I'm going to present uh, will be of interest and hopefully will inspire you to consider how a grassroots approach with the help of community animators can make change happen at the local level and in a democratic way. So to give you some orientation, I want to begin with letting you know where Chicago is. These are the United States. They're purposely in red and blue, not because those are our flag colors, but because we just had an election recently. Um, and so these represent the winners of the governor's race. So the governor runs the whole state of, of, of Illinois, for example, which is where Chicago is. So just to put it in perspective, I think I can use this. Um, this is Illinois. That star is Chicago. The red equals Republican-run states, and the blue equals Democrat-run states. Do you know the difference between Republicans and Democrats? Excellent. <laughs> From some of people's perspective, including mine, these are not good colors right now for the state of the United States. Uh, the other states did not have elections, if you wonder why they're gray. Um, historically, Illinois has been and continues to be a majority Democrat, even when led by Republican governor. We've had a history that we just have a new Republican governor and we're, we're going to see how that works. Um, this is important to know since the political relationship between the state and local government and Chicago specifically is very important when considering community development issues in the city. So this is a more close-up view of Chicago in the state of Illinois and actually it represents, this is the economic geography of Chicago. So Chicago actually covers, oops, wrong way. Chicago covers into the next state over on the east, which is Indiana, and actually goes up into Wisconsin, which is to the north of it. Um, despite the red, Chicago itself is a fairly blue area um, for now. We'll see how that changes. By the numbers, there are about 9.5 million people who live in the Chicago region. Um, and that includes those counties I was talking about. About 2.7 people live in the city of Chicago, and it's a majority Democrat, as I said. The state of Illinois only has about 12.8 million people, so a large number of people live in this region. The joke is there's Chicago and then there's the rest of the state. And that's important because we really do have a political pull and power in the, in the state of Illinois. Um, this is actually our, our flag for the city of Chicago, white, and the colors red, white, and blue are very typical of Chicago. Chicago itself is known as the city of big shoulders and the windy city, and that is because of the politicians, by the way, but also because of the wind in the city um, and the cold winter winds, which I left to come to balmy Switzerland, thank you. Um, it is also known as the city of neighborhoods, and this map up here is a map that, for the most part, has not changed since 1930. There were two additional communities added, but this was created by the University of Chicago um, to do research on neighborhood change, and that's my dissertation research, which actually looks at the origins of these concepts and how it evolves and continues on to shape how we understand neighborhood change. There's about 77 what we call community areas in Chicago. They're used by organizers, they're used by foundations, they're used to discuss elections, although we have different boundaries for elections. But everyone thinks of Chicago in this way. It's a unique feature to Chicago compared to every and any other city in the United States. 
So today I'm drawing from a forthcoming book called Reclaiming Neighborhood, New Ways of Interpreting Neighborhood Change, which I've co-written with my colleague, John Betancourt. Our thesis is quite simple. Neighborhoods have become sites of consumption and sites to be consumed. They are becoming less conducive to social reproduction for all people, and it's quite hard for low-income families with limited means to consume services, shelter, food, childcare, etc. This is true for Pilsen. This is actually where Colette and Alex stayed when they came last fall to visit. This is a sign by a neighborhood group that started a campaign several years ago called Pilsen is Not for Sale. The past few decades, yeah, thank you. It's great, I love the team here. Um, <laughs> thank you, I kept trying to do it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, the past few decades, community developers and organizers have worked within this commodification framework. Um, as a result, they have, been, they have focused on building affordable housing and providing services the market has not been providing. It's actually a lot of community development. About 90% of the community development corporations in the United States, um, until recently, all they did really was build affordable housing. Um, so we don't have it being built by the state or by the federal government, but it's by local nonprofits. However, over time, this method of producing affordable housing, trying to deal with what the market wasn't providing, many people started to see wasn't really working. What they saw was that as they looked at the problem, it didn't really change the conditions, it just managed them. I would argue a growing number of grassroots efforts this past five years, especially in Chicago and elsewhere in the United States, has caused a shift. The recession also made it hard to develop housing, which slowed down totally to a stop, actually, what nonprofits and community-based organizations were doing since that was most of their work. And it really limited resources for services. And as you know, Occupy Wall Street broadened the base of support for a new community and family-focused approach to community development and to dealing with living in cities in general, I would argue. So in this community versus commodity framework, I want to think, um, too, that this awareness, and there was a great deal of anger in the age of austerity that we're in now, have pushed many to look for alternatives. In Chicago, when mayor, uh, the mayor closed 50 public schools and several mental health clinics, but then within a few weeks, promised $60 million to a private developer for a new sports stadium, one where the team doesn't play that well, by the way. Um, they're not even a professional sport. Uh, many were shocked, but also ready to work to change the city's priorities. However, it's not just a fight against the mayor or elites. It's really a fight over who controls land and invests in the city. And community development and organizing have been part of this struggle for many years, and now it's in a sort of, what I'm saying is a new phase. Since the 1970s, many community-based organizations in Chicago and elsewhere have been transformed into extensions of the local governance regime, which relies on a constant cycle of investment and disinvestment to generate land value in order to increase revenue. We rely heavily on land value for our tax base. However, some of us feel there, there is hope, um, and not just to play with what our president's you know, motto was when he was running for president, uh, hope. Um, we see in recent efforts, um, and specifically in Chicago, called Take Back Chicago, which I'll talk about, um, we're trying to take back Chicago and to work to change the course toward more balance and community-controlled development. So today, briefly, I'm going to just um, talk to you about, I feel I need to give you some background. So I'm going to give you a brief history of Chicago's community development and organizing. I'm going to talk about the current conditions in Chicago, which are, present the challenges. And then we're going to look at some of the strategies or what we see as um, ongoing development of solutions and draw some conclusion from that. So first, what we call a very brief history of community development and organizing in Chicago. I have a class if you want to come and take it for 16 weeks. Um, <laughs> but summing up the past 100 years in what I would say are three um, words, are three, um, three competing players is the better way to say it. We have progressives, we have politicians, and we have the power of the people. Um, this is always with a focus on change or reform, um, as I use the word struggle, it's very common. Um, none of this was out without struggle. So these are sort of emblematic, these are books you can buy on these folks. Um, as you know, Jane Addams, I know many people know Jane Addams, she helped for women's voting rights, workers' rights, and child labor laws. She was, um, along with El um, Ellen Gates Starr, founded the Hull House, which is actually at UIC. Despite what my university did, we still have a little bit left of Hull House. 
Um, she created a space uh, along with her partners for research, empirical study, and analysis, and debate. I think that's very important. Um, she was a, it was a pragmatic center for provide, providing support and living among lower income families, helping immigrants assimilate, creating a space for workers to organize and women to gather and live. Hull House was the first settlement house in Chicago and one of the earliest in the country. While it does not operate as an active center for people to live or provide services today, it continues to be a space for discussion, debate, and sharing knowledge around community and social justice issues. The second book, or second person, that is really important of my, of my trio that I'm going to talk about, the first two you probably know, so Jane Addams and then Saul Alinsky, who's sort of the founder of traditional Chicago style, and now American and internationally known organizing. Um, he began organizing in the 1930s and in the stockyards where conditions for workers were terrible. He helped them fight for better working conditions and pay. He formed the Woodlawn Organization, which is a neighborhood in the community of south, of the south side of Chicago. That was to help blacks, that was a primarily African American community, to um, get more from the city, but also to actually be able to vote. This is in the 1960s when um, African Americans were really uh, getting their, their chance to vote. Um, he was also the, um, a founder of the Industrial Areas Foundation, which still exists today to help trainers organize and help create community development organizations around the country. As his book title here is, he was a rebel. And for all of you who've ever read his book, he gave us rules to be radicals. The third person is probably lesser known to you, but I feel you need to know her. Gail Sincata. She was this dynamo of a woman living on the west side of Chicago. She looked around her community of Austin, which was at the time rapidly changing from being white to black, and said something is going on here and there's something happening, particularly with the way real estate is being valued and who, based on who lives here. She called into question, she called her friends around and they gathered and they decided to do something about it. And what they found was that banks were not investing in their community. The banks were in their community, but they were loaning their money to other neighborhoods and not theirs. She helped found one of the key principal, uh, or key programs still in existence today. It hasn't been gutted yet by some of the Republicans we have in office who've been trying to, but a Community Invest Reinvestment Act, a simple term to reinvest back in the community, communities that they were, if there's a term redlining, are you familiar? You draw a red line around the map and you say, no money goes here, a money goes over here instead. And that's what was happening to her neighborhood because blacks were moving in. So she fought hard to do that. She also fought to get um, the data from banks to be made publicly available so that we researchers and community people could see what was happening and actually hold them accountable. And because of her work, and then many since then, there has been billions of dollars put back into communities around the country, including leading up to, and, um, and excuse me, including following up after the foreclosure crisis that we have just been going through and are still really going through in our, in our city. So I think that's important. Each represents an effort to change the relationship between communities and political economy, or as Henri Lefebvre would say, the production of space. And my argument is in Chicago and other cities, the production of space has resulted in the commodification of the neighborhood. So I want you to keep that in mind. So there's also the other P, politicians. Um, we have a city known as having strong mayors, as strong as in power and strong as in personality. If you're not familiar with these men, um, we only had one woman, sadly she just died a week, a week ago, actually our first and only uh, female mayor, uh, Jane Byrd. The, oh, there we go. This is Mayor Daly, the first, or Ma Richard J. Daly. Below him is his son, which is Richard M. Daly. Between is Harold Washington, um, the only, uh, the, the, not the only, but the best known African American president, uh, mayor, that's a slip, mayor that we had in Chicago, sadly died in office. Um, he actually beat out Jane Byrne um, in um, 1980, ooh, don't give me on dates, 83. Um, and so he was uh, seen as the mayor. I purposely put their, him sort of between and to the side from them and to the left even. Um, even though they're all Democrats, they're part of a, and part of a democratic machine as it's referred to in, in different ways. Um, these two represent a dynasty of the, d the democratic machine. Harold Washington came in and a grassroots effort to bring together African Americans and Latinos, which was a growing population in Chicago, to actually grow up a neighborhood-based support and to challenge the machine. And many people were very satisfied when he won, 
However, they saw that it was still hard to undo the machine, and I think that's important to keep in mind. We have a long history, and it continues to operate today. As a result of this machine, and a result of these folks in different ways, um, this all makes the work of community-based organizations and, and organizers even more necessary and important. And I think most would agree, a reason Chicago has such a long history of organizing and strong groups doing community development work. Groups like these. So there are several. These are many. Just wanted to highlight a few. Part of it is because these are ones that represent very different activities. And if you ever come to Chicago, I'd make sure you get to meet all of the folks who are doing this. Um, but they also represent some longevity. Um, so several have been here for many years. Um, I would say that uh, Bigger Dyke Redevelopment Corporation has been here, uh, is up in here my longest. I've worked with them many times. They are a large nonprofit that builds a lot of affordable housing. They fight hard, they do organizing in communities that are gentrifying and don't want affordable housing, so they are a strong group to look at and understand that. Other groups that are listed up here, I just had to include, um, if you're not familiar with Rainbow Push Coalition, are people familiar with that? Operation Push, Jesse Jackson uh, Sr. Uh, formed the group to actually help economic development in the African American community. He actually ran for president at one point in the, in the 80s. Um, and so that organization continues to meet and um, go strong in the city of Chicago. Um, another group that I want to point out is uh, Chicago Rehab Network. They represent an umbrella of 45 different community-based organizations. They have been going strong for 35 years, the same amount of time that our organization, my, my center, has been going. We've worked together for that whole time period to help redevelop neighborhoods, to rebuild and um, to sp uh, preserve affordable rental housing in the city of Chicago. And there are other groups up here. This uh, Southeast Environmental Task Force, a mere 25 years old, has been working on environmental issues on the south side of Chicago, bringing together Latinos and African Americans around uh, some pretty bad um, environmental issues. And one north side I brought up because they're an interesting group that has merged and does a lot of organizing. And the north side, which as you'll see in a few minutes, has historically been uh, the sort of the upper income white neighborhoods of Chicago. However, it's still, these groups work, uh, the one north side works to preserve affordable housing as well as to keep um, housing, uh, keep communities um, mixed and um, as integrated as possible. So, current conditions and challenges. I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly just because it's a, some data to give you a, the groundwork for what's going on. And I'm going to talk about really what's happened since the Great Recession, as we like to call it, um, and to illustrate the volatility and unevenness in the real estate market. Um, in, in Chicago. Um, as, as it's rebounded most, um, in the, really in the last two years, we've, we've come back and actually in some neighborhoods exceeding what we were doing before the, the, the crash happened and before the recession. Um, but what you'll see is, and I'm going to talk about this growing inequality that we're witnessing. These are all conditions that really challenge what we are doing today in around community organizing. So to, to, to use the phrase from the famous Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I use this in talks, I've been doing this for two years now, um, and it's not just me. It's people in the business world, it's people in community-based organizations. It is a lot, there are a lot of people who speak about two cities and Chicago growing to become two cities. But, so, the best of times. This is, if you come to down, see downtown Chicago today, most of these are renderings, with the exception of some of them are actual built already. But by the year 2015, end of year 2015, we're anticipating about 7,000 new market rate luxury rental apartments in and around the downtown. None of these are designated affordable housing or social housing, just to put that in record. They could have been, but that's a longer story and we don't have time or I'd have to do it over a beer maybe later. But these are, there, there are many of these going up everywhere. Usually 500 units or more um, is the going rate. <laughs> so, the worst of times. Everyone is excited that when we see that there was all this building, that must mean that people are coming to Chicago. If you know there's a phrase, if you build it, they will come. It's famous from a movie. However, what we found is that we've had a lot of volatility in our, in our population over this time. Um, and particularly what we saw was in the last decade, we lost over 200,000 people. We didn't lose them, they left. I mean, we, we, can, we can find them somewhere probably, but they left the city. Um, that's important. Um, and that's between 2000 and 2010, which is up. Um, which, 
is our, our decennial census, or every 10 years, we actually do it more often. But um, this population loss was significant. The number of households, though, didn't change much, and that's important. So what I note here is that we lost that many people, but we actually didn't lose that many households. Do you know what I mean? So a household actually occupies a housing unit. So when we look at it, we, we didn't have that much of a shrinkage of people who could occupy housing as households. And actually we have many more people who are doubled up or could be moving into housing if that housing I showed you was affordable to them. So that's important to keep in mind. What was really significant was two things. One was nine out of 10 of the people who left the city for whatever reason were African American. And that's important. The other statistic that no one really was talking about until I started asking the question was the majority of the people missed, that we saw lost in this population or gone were children. So we've become a city that is actually about 28% of the households have children under the age of 18. We are below the national average now um, by five percentage points, and we've been shrinking in families for a very long time. This is, a co this is common in cities around the United States, by the way, but Chicago is actually ahead of, uh, or below the national average. What has changed, though, and where people are saying is that the best of times, the worst of times, depending on who you're talking to and looking at, is this map. Um, is a very stark map meant to show the gain or the loss in population. So the red is the loss of population, the blue is the gain. What, was, what caught everyone's eye was who actually we gained. We gained young people, young, highly educated people, which is what every mayor dreams of, to be honest with you, because that means they are probably have income earning potential, they have money to spend, they'll, they'll have taxes for you. What, the reason it stands out too is that Chicago, of the, top, of, of the top 50 cities in the United States, was number one in terms of gain of this population. So what we've seen is a replacement or a shifting of African Americans who are of different income levels, by the way, with a replacement of white, higher educated, um, uh, and potentially higher income. I, trust me, in the United States these days, higher wages are not always associated with um, higher education levels because of the income, the, I mean, the market right now, but that's basically what we see. And it's creating even more of what we're seeing is a, a racial divide in the city because historically African Americans have had lower education levels. So if that hasn't gotten you down, um, this is what we see in Chicago. Another concern is income inequality. And in the United States has been paying a great deal of attention to income inequality. What we find though is that Chicago is ranked number eight where one is the, is the highest or the most extreme income equality, we're number eight, um, New York City is only two above us, in the wealth gap contest. The wealth gap is really looking at the spread between those in the top 5% and those in the, the poorest 20%. So if you look at this, these numbers, what we find is that the poorest are, are the richest, excuse me if you wanna say, the wealthiest are 12.5 times higher income than the poorest. Uh, and that's significant, um, we think. Despite what seems to be a high income, you know, a lot of, we have people in that high income bracket of over $200,000, which is pretty significant. So the United States is around $55,000 for, you know, median income. Um, this projection looks like Chicago did better, you know, during this 10-year period. But if you adjust for inflation, we actually lost ground. Most of the United States did, by the way, during this time. So that's, you know, again, putting it in context. But what's striking, and this is some research that we're going to be releasing soon, working with the University of Toronto um, in Canada, to look at this question of what we're calling the tale of two, maybe three cities. What the two or three cities are, and again, sorry, the red, white, and blue just works visually for people. I'm not trying to be all United States patriotic, but it does help to, to work the show this. But if you look at these colors, the blue and the darker blue especially represents very high income people based on a per capita income, so per person income. The reds and the very dark reds in particular represent the very lowest income by per capita. And what you have squeezed in the middle is white or beige, and that represents the middle income. If I, I was gonna do a whole time series, but basically this map is different than it was in 1970, and what you see is we have very extremes, very extreme conditions, high and low income with very little middle class. If I put the whole region out there, you would see the middle class are living out where we'd expect in the suburbs. 
But what we see is that we've lost a lot of the middle class in the city, and yet when you look at, net, at, at policies, most of them are geared towards the middle class. So they're not necessarily accommodating either group. Okay, quickly, this is about our segregation problem. If you're not familiar, Chicago is the second most segregated city, I think, right now in the United States by race. The, the Latino map over here kind of shows where <laughs> Latinos live, um, down in here. And then this is where African Americans primarily live and have concentrated mostly for the, since the 1920s. Um, just gotten larger. If you put the two maps together, what you have left over where whites are living is right up here and down here. So, and then we do have a small and growing Asian population and they're kind of mixed in, if you will. Um, and then uh, stereotypically, they're concentrated in a little area over here called Chinatown. So the next slide is something that unfortunately in Chicago you wake up every morning and you read the Chicago Tribune and they give you a homicide count. Or at least how many people were shot. So this is an accumulative map for 2013 in terms of where homicides have occurred. And note that sadly we get it in terms of single, double, triple homicides. Um, we, we have, and then police homicide too, because we've had a um, series of problems and you're familiar with the United States and what's going on. Most of these are African American men, most of them are happening on the south and west sides of Chicago, but they've ha they have been everywhere. Now with that said, I'd like to say, don't be afraid of the violence to come to Chicago, it's not that serious. <laughs> But it's something that's really weighing heavily on all of us. Um, and, and despite those numbers, actually, we've gone down in homicide rates. Um, and so, you know, there's, there is some promise there, but it's, it's something just weighing heavy. The other thing that's weighing heavy, at least on my mind, and I know several people who work in this area, is the fact that we have a large number of children who are in poverty. And it's highly concentrated in the African American community. And I put the, this, I could put up Latinos, and you would say the, see the same thing when you compare to whites. Well, what's, what's most important is that when I mentioned before about school closings, which was due to population loss primarily, schools were shrinking, 98% of the children affected were African American. So here's a quick map of school closings. Um, in those, so you, after a while you get to know the city of Chicago and you get to know the racial distribution, you get to know the neighborhood space, you kind of know, you'll see the patterns. This is not, um, there are a lot of things to talk about in terms of where these come from and how to understand them, but I'm just giving you context so we know when I talk about these uh, strategies in the next minute. What we did do in Chicago is see as the teachers went on strike. They were very unhappy with what was happening under the current mayor, and they went on strike. And they were very powerful in getting attention to say, we need to bring back and put invest in our public schools and invest our communities. And I think that's important. At the same time, it also greatly impacted the mayor's rating because people around the city galvanized in favor of the teachers. They wanted public schools to be public schools, not charter schools that we were converting to, select enrollment, schools that were becoming elite and exclusion, exclu exclusive of our lower income communities, primarily Latino and blacks. So, the, the, the show Chicagoland, um, I, I don't recommend it necessarily, except it is a very highly stylized documentary about Chicago, and it follows Mayor Emanuel around, and this is the mayor right here. Um, it is this quote, though, that was important to me. Um, it was written by a Chicago poet who was commenting online, and he said, uh, Kevin Koval, and what he said was, you know, Rahm Emanuel is building a second city, two cities really, one white, one black, one for rich, one for poor, one for private schools, one for closed schools. A new Chicago for the saved and the damned. Gold Coast heavens and low-end hells. It's biblical, it's binary. And he went on to talk about how the slick series, as you said, it's really, it is a very slick, really well-crafted you know, crafted, um, series, shows, forgets to, to, or glosses over what he says are the economic injustice, white supremacy, the declining middle class, and the school to prison pipeline, which if you're familiar, what we're seeing is, we know now if we're in third grade what you're doing, if you're gonna go to prison or not. There are people who do research on this. Um, and what he said was, it's showing Chicago in a vacuum rather than in the torrent of history. So I wanna give you a little bit of that torrent of history now and talk about the things that we're working on in Chicago. So we refer to Chicago as a mosaic. It's a set of community-based groups that are working together and are trying to solve a lot of our problems. What, they're, what we're doing is, um, or what we see is, a well-established and universally hailed idea, community development that is, and it's among the most ambiguous 
and contested activities at this time, especially in what I'm calling neighborhood consumption or neighborhood commodification. Still, it is a fundamental part of urban life, playing many roles. Associations defend neighborhoods against others. Strong place-based ethnic or racial platforms for advancement, that's what neighborhoods do as well, and community-based organizations do. They are also a quasi-welfare shadow state, of helping disadvantaged people. They are also co-opted institutions, operating as middlemen between the outside and the inside, between classes and races, between the state and the citizen. They are also spaces for intervention. I'm okay in time? Okay. <laughs> um, for innovation and social change. Most community development in the U.S. is done by people employed or volunteering in financially strapped organizations continuously facing the possibility of extinction. It's always, you know, can we pay the bills, uh, the checks are behind from the state, you know, all these things that these organizations, but they continue on, like I showed you, in, in over many years. Um, they're caught in the pressure be uh, and between the pressures and the needs of their communities and the priorities and agendas of funders and outside forces. And most, but not all, recognize that government, corporate, or foundation largesse, that is the funding, supporting community development, will not fund the revolution. And that neighborhoods are probably not the optimal site for that revolution or for advancing some of the changes needed to transform inequities. However, they prevail, and this is where the fight usually goes on. So here's just to kind of think about what's happening in this tale of two cities, or in these two extreme spaces that you saw on the maps. And keeping those cautions in mind that I said and where the revolution can occur and it won't be funded um, by, the, by the government. Um, we can find several strategies that aim to change the conditions that I just described, which, present, um, which represent potential to change the field in the, in the city. But let's consider first these two extreme situations in Chicago to see just how neighborhoods are being commodified through private investment that is publicly given. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of public subsidy to help this kind of development going on. Since the recession, places like Inglewood, which is represented by these boarded up homes here, um, which is what Inglewood is. Um, you can go down blocks and have, actually most of, many homes are, are gone. It's a very vacant um, space. It's a large neighborhood on the south side. Um, what we find there is uh, that this has been, uh, has been a long period of disinvestment and it's struggling with high crime and foreclosure. It's sort of what we call stuck in limbo. Um, at the same time, billions of dollars are being invested a few miles north in the West Loop where Google is building its new offices. And it keeps expanding before they've even opened. This is not Google. This is actually a high-rise apartment complex that comes along with a hotel that the neighbors in that community are not wanting. So what you have here is you have the, the extremes of, of a poor neighborhood that is struggling with foreclosure and, la and disinvestment. And then you have a higher income neighborhood that's struggling with in disinvestment or what we're calling uber gentrification. And both are, are feeling the pressures of the real estate market. So how do we respond? Well, the mayor decided that in this area he would put in a Whole Foods. Are people familiar with Whole Foods? The nickname is Whole Paycheck. It is a very good organic food store, typically, but it's very expensive, and it's not something that the communities can afford. He thinks this is the great idea because it will transform. The residents living there, however, feel it'll transform in a way that they will have to move out. It's not for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I needed some validation there, I realized. Uh, um, so you have this going on in this neighborhood where the public sector is actually inducing development um, and then you have the private sector coming in and inducing more development on top of already gentrification that's been going on for a while. So we have what we call the ghettoization and we have the uber gentrification happening in Chicago. And that's what that dark red and dark blue map was really representing. So those are those two extremes. Thinking about those conditions then, how do we deal with them? I don't know if you're familiar with um, Sherry Arnstein, but she wrote a, a nice little paper in 1969 about participation. She was actually writing about it during urban renewal in the United States, and she wanted to capture what she saw was the lack of genuine participation in decisions in government. And so what she talks about is as you move up the ladder from what she calls manipulation and therapy to informing and consultation and placation, what you see is non-participation goes to tokenism, goes to citizen power, and this gets up into these levels of citizen control, delegated power, and partnership. The strategies I'm going to close with to talk about, I'm going to talk about today and close with, are ones that fall into this category. 
I hope. We, we're seeing how they're gonna go. So, um, what we, to talk through this, I wanted to look at what's happening in terms of these different categories, and I'll talk about those now. So one of the things that's probably less known to people is actually a great deal of work by public housing residents in Chicago to bring attention to what's been happening for the last 15 years called the transformation of public housing. And what they've been doing is calling out what they say are human rights violations. They say, you know, if, it, if you do this in Zimbabwe, it's wrong. If we do it in the United States, almost the same thing in terms of displacement of people, it's okay. And part of that is the United States has a long history of not signing on to some of these treaties. But residents said, that's not right. And so they've actually been, cap um, been able to bring in, for the, um, since 2004, the Special Repertoire on Housing um, from the United Nations to come in and see what the conditions are, to actually publish a report about what's happening in Chicago and elsewhere, and to actually bring it to light even more recently around the foreclosure crisis, which has been characteristically affecting African Americans more than anyone else in the city. So, Human rights can only do so much in a country that doesn't recognize them, but it has gotten into the courts now, and that's really important, I think. So we don't often think about, well, we do in the United States think about the courts a lot, because we use the law a lot, but to think about human rights is very important, and, and Chicago has been a leader on that in terms of engaging in, this, in using these instruments to get changes to happen, and they've actually won some, some cases, which I could talk about to you all later at some point, but they're kind of detailed and a little nuanced. What we've also seen, though, is an interesting, again, borrowing from other places, um, this time South Africa, we have the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign. They're working to prevent people from losing their homes illegally to foreclosure. This includes tenants, those people who rent, as well as owners. This also um, is interesting because what they're doing is really going in and stopping people from being evicted in what they say are unlawful ways. So they're coming in and blocking the police from coming in. But the other thing they've done is, to use the phrase, they've liberated housing. They've taken um, householdless homes, that is homes without households living in them, or familyless homes is the way they say it, and they've given them families. And they've opened up these homes, which is illegal somewhat, unless you beautify the home, then the law says you can be there. The police are actually allowing them to go into neighborhoods. They work with neighborhoods, the people in the neighborhoods, and they liberate the homes so a family that's formerly homeless could move in. Not everyone's comfortable with this, but it's an interesting strategy. It's part of a larger movement called Take Back the Land in the United States that's been happening to transform the way we think about how we, we live on the land, how we use it, and again, how real estate is actually a commodity rather than a place for people to live and call home. We also have people who are fighting to get their benefit, to get community benefits. Are people familiar with community benefits agreements? These are again legal tools. So if a developer comes into a community and says, you know, we're going to build a lot of this expensive housing, but we'll also put in some affordable housing. Now in, in Switzerland, I heard, you know, I was hearing it, I know that there's there may be more um, state um, leadership on this, but in the United States, what we see is it's really driven by community and the developers as to what this will look like. Community benefits agreements are legal tools that residents um, go into a legal agreement with the developer and say, if you're going to build here and you need my support, which they do usually need their support, they have to get support and the elected officials will ask, are you supportive in the community? They say, we need to have benefits in return. Some of it is about getting a guarantee of some affordable housing if it's a housing development. Other times though, it, and more importantly, it's about getting jobs, getting access to the labor um, that is used to build that housing. Um, if it's retail or you know, any types of, of, of commercial space, the jobs that are going to be produced for that. So really getting a guarantee that they get access to that economic benefit. And there are other things that they look for as well, but those are typically the two things that go in there. Chicago fought hard, um, residents of Chicago fought hard to get a community benefits agreement when we were gonna get the Olympics. So that was a big, you know, that's billions of dollars being invested in neighborhoods. So they worked hard. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, we did not get the Olympics. Most of us say good. It's never usually as good as it sounds, but that was, a, it set the stage. Now what we have is going on real time is down on the, sou um, the southeast side of the city. The last piece of land that can be developed on the lakefront is being 
um, has a development plan in the billions of dollars. It's going to produce thousands of housing units and all this commercial space next to a very low-income Latino neighborhood. Um, and so what they're working on right now, this Alliance of the Southeast, is a community benefits agreement that will assure that they get those jobs and affordable housing, but also the right to be able to stay put and some assurances. So they're negotiating these things right now. The challenge with these kinds of agreements is knowing exactly what you can ask for. And what historically has happened, and you see it in, in cases in New York and such like that, they don't ask enough. That is, the community doesn't ask enough. This group, stay tuned, because they are asking a lot, and it's still to be determined, but this is probably going to be an important case of, of an example of positive community benefits agreement, if they can get what they want, which, like I said, is a lot to benefit the residents, but not to take away from the developer's ability to develop, okay? Does that make sense? This is going to be over 40 years, by the way. So this isn't a short-term project. This is a huge project with billions and billions of dollars. I like the billions these days. That seems to be everything we've been doing in Chicago is these big billion-dollar projects now. We're trying to keep up with New York, you know? Um, another strategy is community land trusts. Are people familiar with community land trusts? That's probably something a little bit more common. Um, the community land trust, in very simple terms, is uh, the idea of having a nonprofit organization control the uh, what's happening in the community in terms of development by controlling the land. So they form a, a membership organization, a nonprofit. They draw a boundary and say, this is the land trust, and anything in it that is properties are land trust properties. However, it's more complicated. They basically control the development or the improvements on top of the land, the house, for example. And they say, when you build a house, or you renovate a house, or you want to donate your house to be in the land trust, we will make sure that the, afford the affordability continues on forever, or in perpetuity is the phrase. What that is, is it restricts the resale on it. This is technical stuff, but just think about this. In Burlington, Vermont, they've had land trusts for 40 years, and homes that have been in that land trust that have sold four, five, six, seven times are still affordable to the same family income level that they were the first time as they were the seventh time. The reason that's important is because that's not how it usually works in the United States. It's usually about appreciation. You want your house to go up in value. So it's a way to lock in. Not every house is in the land trust, but several are. We have these three houses We literally represent the first community land trust of Chicago. Those are renderings that were built in a very low-income African-American community. Um, they hope to build more. Um, they're very affordable for a family of four to move in. We also have um, evidence of how it works in a high-income community, in Highland Park. And I'm proud to say that I've worked with both of these communities to develop their land trusts. Highland Park is a very um, high-end community on the North Shore. They've been able to build over 40 units of affordable housing in an area that has historically not had that much affordable housing and has lost it. So what and they're trying to do is do that in a larger area. What it does is it creates what we call balanced development. And again, I'm getting back to control of real estate and how development happens. That's the direction that community development is going. So another area we're going, and I'm, I'm gonna wrap up in a minute, is we are going towards participatory budgeting. Are you familiar with this term? PB, as we like to call it, because it's a lot to say, participatory budgeting. <laughs> but PB is, a, is not just unique to Chicago, it's happening in New York and in New Orleans and other places, and it comes really from Brazil. If you're familiar with Kertaba, they, that's really where it starts. But if we go, if we think of Brazil, uh, I think of what was going on, we have right now about 1,500 participatory budgets being developed around the world. Chicago is working on right now 50 out of its, uh, out of its excuse me, five out of its 50 wards have had residents for uh, two to three years doing their own budgeting process. They're given the money, they're given the resources, and they don't just play it like a game, which is a lot of people think it's like Monopoly or some game like that. They actually get very educated about what they can and cannot do with resources. They look at trade-offs, they have debates, they spend a lot of time, as this process shows, getting educated and coming together before they vote. It's a very democratic process. It's really interesting to watch. So this is, again, taking control of what's happening in budgeting. And I'm, I'm happy to say that my colleague, Rachel Weber, at UIC, I'm not just trying to highlight UIC, by the way, but my colleague, Rachel Weber, is doing, leading this um, at the Great Cities Institute. So if you have further information, uh, want further information, it's on their website. The last thing I'm going to leave with is really in the organizing realm. So we have now a growing, growing, multi-issue grassroots organizing effort happening. It started with Stand Up Chicago, which I was, I had this image, they stood up, right? We stand up. The next step was to take back. So people started standing up together in 2009. 
conveniently Wall, Occupy Wall Street happened and, and it really galvanized a lot more people in a larger organizing effort. The focus was on very simple jobs, schools, housing, fundamentals. They were able to bring together thousands of people and now at this point called Take Back Chicago, we're capable of getting referendum on the state election uh, cycle a couple weeks ago to do a couple things. And I went to a celebration a week and a half ago to celebrate the fact that they got a, a majority, about two thirds of the voters to support two different things. One was to raise the minimum wage which is huge in, in the Chicago area to raise it to 15. I know you all don't realize how much we use Europe and all of this, the rest of the world, and you know, to show what it would be like if we had living wages. So $15 an hour would double our current wage, um, uh, going wage. Okay, just to put that in perspective. And we don't, we just got healthcare barely. Okay, so this group has really done a lot to raise awareness to get support for that. The other thing they did was they got support for what they call the million dollar tax. Anyone over a million dollars has to pay a little bit more and it's good to go to childcare. The other thing they're doing though that I think is really interesting, and this is where I talk about democracy, being really about democracy, is watching closely and grading with a report card system the elected officials, and we're, we're represented by aldermen, they're called. So our elected officials, which we have 50, you can go onto their website and you can learn how they're doing on their issues, on your issues, I would say. Uh, and that's really important because people, it's a way for people to hold accountable their elected officials. They have something concrete to hold up to them. The other thing that I think is important is um, this coalition has come together as a very neighborhood-based, identifying by neighborhood. And that's, that's the way Chicago thinks of itself. It's very focused like Saul Alinsky, but it's multi-issue, which is different than Saul Alinsky, and that's very exciting for people to see. It's also multi-race. Saul Alinsky was usually one class, one group, one neighborhood. This is multi. Um, it's also in the spirit of Jane Addams because she was all about voting and rights for voting and making sure that people get out the vote. We registered 167,000 new people this election cycle. That's huge, most of them in immigrant communities. Um, and to this end, the coalition holding these, okay, these elected officials accountable is also holding the mayor accountable. And I think I'm not going to get too much into that, but I wanted to point out that one of the things that happened recently was the teachers union, as we were talking about earlier, decided to run a candidate. They wanted to run the head of the teachers union. Unfortunately, Karen Lewis, who's in this picture to the left, literally days before announcing her candidacy was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. Very sad. And she's doing okay. She's had surgery and she's okay. But it, it really threw what was a clear momentum to a halt. And I point this out because, as I said earlier, politics is very important and it drives the kind of community organizing we do and the kind of development we do in Chicago. If you don't understand that by now, I hope you, you know, you'll walk away and think about this more. It's, it's not just because I want to pick on our mayor. Sometimes do. But uh, it's because we have to pay attention constantly. So when that happened and this void was created, a lot of people were concerned what was going to happen to this, what we saw as momentum for community um, development and organizing. Stepping forward and the union, the teachers union is backing among uh, many other people who have actually gotten him on the ballot is Chewy Garcia. Oh, I lost it. There he is. So Chewy, as he's called, his name is Jesus Garcia, is the first Mexican-American to run for mayor in the city of Chicago. I'm mean, sorry, first Mexican-American to be a council member. He's a Cook County commissioner right now, which means he's at a higher level of government. He decided to step in, and people are volunteering. There are thousands of people, in full disclosure, he was my student. <laughs> he really was. I, you know, in planning, we say do no harm. So I take no claim to him. But um, he, was my, um, he was a great student, and he's, um, I'm working on his campaign, along with, like I said, thousands of people. It's a truly grassroots campaign. Um, but the point of this is, not because of just this moment, but it's good timing to talk about, is more because if you paid attention to what happened in New York when Bill de Blasio was elected, he was elected on, a, in, on trying to end inequality. And that's the same campaign that Chewy is running on. And what's interesting now is seeing how this is, seeing, is being said to start the momentum towards change in Chicago, change in the United States, in cities at least. Even though, as I showed you earlier, we have a very red country, there are, these are blue cities that are trying to take back and change, challenge and change the way things are going. So what I wanted to say is that um, this spring, we might shake some things up in, windy, in the Windy City. So in conclusion, if we look at this ladder and where we're moving to, I would say that 
Community development and organizing at this time is moving up the ladder and is building a new grassroots movement in Chicago. However, like all movements, it requires constant activity to keep it moving. Otherwise, we slide down the ladder. Many say that the US is at a crossroads. One road takes us toward a more austere future, highly favorable of community investment and corporate growth schemes, such as the ones I talked about earlier, and what I would classify as an anti-community direction, while the other takes us toward a place of investment in our communities in ways that are radical, as in returning to our roots, and to the people. Clearly, many believe we are on the first path that is moving away from the community, but others, after the last election results, have said this was a wake-up call and a real call for action. Again, we'll see. I'm not sure where we're going to be in 10 years. It is, a, it is still an exciting and even, even if troubling time to be in Chicago. I hope you'll come visit the city of big shoulders and windy politicians, and most importantly, the city of neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet, for this uh, very interesting and inspiring impulse. And uh, thank you for compressing your class into 45 minutes. <laughs> but I hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think there is still uh, a reason to go to Chicago and to visit your class and to, to hear some more about all this. Now we have some minutes uh, left uh, before we make the break for questions to Janet. We have noch einige Minuten Zeit uh, für Fragen an Janet. Die können in Englisch gestellt werden oder in Deutsch. Ich versuche sie zu übersetzen und wenn sie auf Französisch kommen, werden sie auf Französisch. Yeah. Maybe I start with a question. Um, uh, maybe uh, one question that a lot of people are interested in is um, what role do the professional organizers or community developers play in all those movements you have mentioned? Yeah, um, they play a very strong role. So those um, marches that I showed you earlier, um, you know, all these people gathering, to, to create, to get that many people to show up, you need a lot of organization and organizers, right? So you need people doing very basic things in organizing, which is you identify who you need to get there, you have phone calls you make, you have email you send, text messages, you are checking, and in Chicago the phrase is you get them on the bus. What that means is, so it's from back in the 60s when uh, Saul Linsky was organizing in Woodlawn. You wanted to get people on the bus, and literally we get buses to bring people who don't have transportation of their own to get to wherever the event is. And it's very, it's very um, heartwarming actually to see when the doors open and how many people file out. But to see every person filing out means there were probably, you know, one organizer for 10 people that showed up. Now that's not literally the ratio that is, you know, when you look at the job description, but it takes a lot of people doing organizing, paid and otherwise. I wanted to say one thing about that though, which is really interesting. I said earlier about this fight to raise the minimum wage, it's called the fight for 15. What is interesting in this discussion was a recognition that a lot of organizers don't get paid that well either. They are underpaid and usually didn't have health benefits, you know, all the things that they were working on the line with to fight for. And so I think it really actually raised a lot of awareness that organizing matters and organizing should be valued literally in terms of what people are paid. So they play a very strong role in just getting people out, but they also play a role to get people out. What do you have to do? You have to educate people. You have to bring the information to the people there, and you have to bring it either yourself directly or you educate your community members. The best person to educate your neighbor is your neighbor. Not me, the professional organizer or the professor. It's your neighbor. And so a lot of organizing is spent in meetings, over the weekends, over, you know, in whatever, they, wherever they can meet and talk with you and getting people to understand. We do a lot of training um, so that you can actually have people who I know how to talk and speak on message, whether it's to elected officials or to their neighbors. So it's a very structured process if you follow the, the Saul Alinsky method. 
However, we also followed other methods as well. There's a lot of group work that's done to educate the community about the issues and then to go forth and decide what they want to do to work on those issues. So we have some tension even in Chicago about even what organizing should look like. Community driven or, or organizer driven, but we have a lot of strong professionals. Just one last thing is we are a very strong union town um, and something many of us are proud of. We have some very high level, high well-paid or union organizers that work for worker unions. Um, and have crossed over though into community development because that's the, the unions themselves recognize that they were losing their, their sort of um, value in society, partly because the union membership was dropping, but also without being connected to community, they were losing membership. And they also, so they started working on community development. So the unions are actually heavily involved in community now. So I think that's the other thing is you're bringing a professional organizers that are that are used to organizing in different um, situations. Yeah. Thank you. Schönen guten Tag. Mein Name ist Katharina Hürlimann. Ich bin eine in Deutsche in, in der Schweiz. Ich entdecke hier, es wird ein Konflikt zwischen also, Gesellschaft und Wirtschaft eigentlich gesehen. Meine Frage ist, wie lässt sich das eigentlich besser vereinbaren? Denn ein funktionierendes Gemeinwesen ist ja Voraussetzung für eine erfolgreiche Wirtschaft. Und es muss nicht a priori ein Konflikt sein. Und inwieweit können wir die Wirtschaft in die Pflicht nehmen, denn die partizipieren von einer guten Ausbildung, von tollen, ausgebildeten Leuten, von Leuten, von Arbeitskräften, aber auch von Konsumenten, die letztendlich wieder ihre Produkte abnehmen. Und letztendlich ist auch Gemeinwesen ein Markt. Ja. Oh, you have the translation already. Okay. And, and what I heard was, or what I understood is, how do you how do you deal with this conflict, right, between sort of what the economy wants and community? Is that and what we the phrase that we use in Chicago, and I, I give credit to the, Sh the Chicago Rehab Network, that group that I showed you has been around for 35 years. Their motto is development without displacement. So how do you do development without so to encourage the development? We don't want to be we're not anti-development. We're development in a way that assures that people can stay in their communities. Um, and so that's why I talk about these, these community benefits agreements. You, it's not to say those billions of dollars shouldn't come in. It's to say, we're, we're not sure if they will, but they're hoping they'll come in to complete the development. But that to do that, they shouldn't forget about the people around the neighborhood around it, or the people who could live in it, that actually would be working in the stores and such like that. So part of it is that. But there are very specific tactics and um, ways to do that. So assurances, like I said, the community benefits agreement is one, but there are other things as well. So we make sure that um, we have a strategy called set-asides. So when you build a, you know, 100 units of housing, you set aside 10, 15, 25, and make them affordable. So that's a, it's, it's the, if you look at it just from the housing perspective, we do that. So that's to make sure the housing is affordable. But the other side is how do you make housing affordable to people? You make sure they have enough income for it. So the other is to make sure that they have well-paying jobs. And it, it, it sounds so basic, but it's, to, it's, it's not to just say you should have it, it's to put legal assurances in place. And that's what we have to do in the United States because the state doesn't necessarily protect um, the, 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 the community's interests. Even though they frame all this development in the interest of community. So if you're familiar, there's a, a phrase from the uh, 1980s called the growth machine strategy. The growth machine is the city downtown is going to percolate up all this money because it's investing in all of this, the housing I showed and, and jobs being created down there. And the city does that, the city center does that. But the question of, does it flow back to the neighborhoods? And so that's where residents are pushing to make sure that it flows back to neighborhoods through the jobs and also assures that the housing has some affordability to it. So does that, does that help answer? Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for asking. It's a very good question. Also, vielleicht noch eine Frage, weil wir sollten die Zeitplan einhalten und nachher ist die Pause angesagt. Also, dann das Beste. Hallo, also, eine erste Frage in Französisch, um zu zeigen, dass die Schweiz multikulturell ist. Je suis Gabriel Bader, je suis sociologue et je suis, je suis toujours étonné de, hein, 
Je suis toujours étonné de voir comment la sociologie américaine classe les gens en fonction euh, des couleurs ou, ou de la race encore aujourd'hui. Et comment vous faites Combien il y a de classes Et comment vous faites pour classer un enfant métis dont le père serait latino et la mère euh, euh, africaine américaine Et comment est-ce que vous faites des distinctions entre quelqu'un qui est, qui est là depuis cinq générations ou un, un Africain qui immigré récent Quelle est la position des... des des Asiatiques, comment vous comptez et comment vous classez Est-ce que sur les passeports, est-ce que dans, à l'État, il y a un endroit où les gens sont classés Comment vous faites Uh, in France, there is no there is no race, right? So, um, so we're we're the opposite. We classify everybody. Although the, the um, so the classification, first of all, and then I'll talk about segregation. Um, it's self it's self identified. So I fill out a, I fill out the U.S. Census form, and it asks me what my race is. Is that so? Is that part of the question you're asking? Just how to understand classification? Um, so the reason that's important is because what's changed over time is the United States isn't black and white. <laughs> it's actually many different mixtures of race, and then we also identify by what we call ethnicity, which is really country of origin, or in the case with the largest, is a, co co a collection of people from what we call Latin America, or Latinos. So what you have is people self-identifying, and what we've seen now is a growth in people who say, I'm two or more races, I identify as Latino, black, you know, they're, they're a mix. But we still can continue to classify. So those maps I did for purpose of speak, not being stark, they're actually, most of those people identified as black or Latino, and they don't, there's no overlap, and most and identify as white. How that gets sustained is the politics of the city of Chicago, most would argue. And some of it has to do with discrimination. So we don't, we actually outlawed discrimination in housing based on race in 1968. Based on current projections, it's going to take another 100 years before we see any significant shifts in places like Chicago or Cleveland or other cities that are historically racially segregated. Um, But what you do see happening is some mixing starting to happen in certain neighborhoods. And that was what actually we thought was a direction we were going. But the last census showed this, this shrinking, the re retreat of African Americans from the city and a replacement by whites. And so this is one of the things that we're paying attention to is this still the shift and where they're going is concentrating in the, in the city center um, and not going really south of the city. So historically, the city itself has had its own boundaries and people have upheld them. Again, if you think about the production of space, I could go into any neighborhood and move in if I wanted to, but why don't I? In Chicago, it's because there are neighborhoods that are identified as what we'd say as no-go areas if you're white, no-go areas if you're black, no-go areas if you're Latino, although Latinos have a way to have been able to move into many more neighborhoods. So some of it is because people don't let you move there And we have evidence of that discrimination happening still, even though it's illegal. But it's also self-choice. You know, people choose, they don't feel welcome. Now, and I said it's changing, but it's been very slow in that process. And then um, there's a great book that's coming out um, called City on the Make, which is actually written by a French sociologist or philosopher. Um, I'm forgetting his first name, Diamond is his last name. But it's about Chicago, and he talks all about how racism has been upheld by nearly every mayor Um, up until sort of the current period. He writes only up and through the 1970s. Um, and he reflects on this, or 1980s, excuse me. And it, he really says that if you look at the way the politics have worked in Chicago, it has helped to uphold that segregation. It's benefit, beneficial if you're an elected official who's black to have black constituency. It's beneficial if you're white to have your white constituency. That's how it's worked. Uh, it's not the right thing, but that's how it is. Does that answer? Yes or no? Okay, I think uh, today Janet will stay with us and there will be the opportunity to ask her maybe in a pause. Thank you again for coming and sharing your knowledge.